I can just spend your five, ten minutes talking about fellowships. Because the assumption is this is one of the most traditional ways of doing capacity development. And the other assumption is people know quite a lot about it. I'll just briefly tell you about the graduate fellowship highlights for 2015. And then I'll talk about the information system that Ido already mentioned. And then I'll talk about what we are looking ahead to in 2016. I spend 50 or 60 percent of my time uh, doing the graduate fellowship and that's partly because I'm paid to do that but number two is because I'm really passionate about this program. I think that we can do the ICT and everything embrace what is happening but within that the developing world or where we are trying to work in this kind of capacity development uh, initiative is still so relevant so that's why I'm still very passionate. And why do I think that ERI still need to continue to invest in the graduate fellowship program? I think we still have an urgent need to create a critical mass of well-trained scientists who can lead and sustain the research agenda in the developing world. So after we elect, we are not here, who will do it? So we need to ensure that we are also training the young generation to do really good quality research, but at the same time thinking about the future so that they can then pass on that knowledge. So if we now dilute the quality now of what we are passing on, you can imagine what will happen to our future. So I think that that's still a very relevant um, thing for ERI to continue to invest in. And I'll just tell you a little bit about the category of, of fellows that we have at ERI because everybody talks about students. So every time you mention student, everybody refers you to Joyce Maru. And then you come and tell them, oh, that one is not an intern. They are a graduate fellow, and everybody is always asking them, what does that mean? So I thought I'd mention that we have three categories at IRURI that fall under the broader umbrella of fellowships. So we have what we call the graduate fellows. These are the ones who come to IRURI to work, for example, to as a master's or a PhD program. They'll be at IRURI for a period of between six months to 36 months, depending on the degree arrangement. And just to remind you that IRURI is not an awarding body. So you don't hear somebody say, I got my degree, I graduated from ERI for my PhD. Mm -hmm. So we work with the academic institutions around the world as a partnership. So what we provide is a mentorship. And we provide also access to our facilities. And we also provide the attachment. So working in collaboration with the academic institutions. Mm -hmm. Then we have the other category called the research fellows. These are the non-degree related training. And they are normally are coming from our national partners. These are the ones you'll hear, they'll come from, for example, to Becca, to do a certain piece of research for six months up to 18 months, again, depending on the arrangement. They are not working towards any qualification, but the idea is they come, complete that uh, piece of research, learn something, and go back to the institutions and apply that, and hopefully also train others on how to do good research. And then we have the third category, who are the interns. These are the short-term on-the-job training professionals. Normally undergraduates from local universities. Um, I like this category because <laughs> I still remember when I was looking for my internship at the fourth year, because we were to just go and look for an internship and you come back. And they always walk into my office with the same kind of feeling, like I wish I can get somewhere to just be placed for three to six months. So we provide that opportunity at IRI, at any one time we have up to 50. They could be within the research projects, but majority of them are placed within the support and admin units for that. So we always insist that they are doing the last year of their graduate training and that it's a requirement of their degree training program. Because again, with a lot of unemployment, we get so many of them knocking at our door and we have to make it relevant. So this is like more like a historical data of where we are coming from. I thought I'll do like three year statistics of what has been happening simply because for one, there's no need of telling you so much about five years ago, but at the same time, these are the records that I can, for example, say 100% accurate <laughs> about it. So this is what has been happening and you can see that um, Majority of the fellows are within the Baker E-Rehab and the LIFES program, but also the rest of the e programs, for example, Livestock System Environment, Food Safety and Zoonosis, LGI, 
have been doing quite a good job on capacity development. And the majority of the people, the majority of those fellows who are not in Becca are the graduate fellows, either working towards a PhD or an MSc. So, so far for the last uh, three years, we've had, we've had around 430 fellows or individuals come through our office. I thought I'd get a clap there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, in 2015, we've been very busy and I want to thank Jennifer for all the work that she's been doing for the last one year. Again, we've had 206 heads or fellows and interns come through our office. Out of this, we say 61% male to 39% female. So we are not doing so badly on gender, but there's still some room for improvement. And we're working with fellows from across the globe, 28 nationalities. So quite a diverse group of people that we work with. In terms of how that looks like, the breakdown of that, you can see as per program. But the graduate fellows, again, they are the highest of the numbers, 111. 46 are the research fellows, and 49 are the, the interns that I spoke about. Um, I think the percentage column is missing somewhere there, but again, the lives and the Baker pro pro programs have the highest. But over 50%, over 50% is happening within the integrated sciences. So who, how, how are these fellows funded? Okay, 206. You can see that's quite a huge investment for ERI. So we have, we are talking of at least 3 million uh, US dollars to take care of uh, those 206 uh, you know, heads that I talk about. But I also special mention, I wanted to mention about our key collaborators. We have the DAD, which is the German uh, exchange program. This year we've managed to recruit eight PhD fellows that are placed within EU graduate programs. And um, the good thing about this model is we are co-funding because the money that we get is not enough. But the EU programs are so willing to really work with us. So we say, okay, 50%, there's $19,000 available, but the cost of a, hosting a graduate fellow at EU is, for example, 26000 so they co-fund the balance, and, and that way we, we also ensure that they pay attention to the fellow because the fellow has to contribute and their research interests are also aligned to what they are trying to achieve. And then there's another program I wanted to mention about called the CIRCLE program. The CIRCLE word is in two parts. That's the first part is climate impact research and then the capacity and leadership enhancement within the sub-Saharan Africa. This program is being funded by DFID, but the implementation, implementing partners is the Association of Commonwealth Universities and the African Academy of Sciences in Africa. And the, we applied as IRI to host, as well as send some of the young emerging scientists away to other institutions to learn and then come back. So it's more like an exchange program. IRI is a host, IRI is a home institute. I like this program because as much as they are focusing on the climate impact research, the program sits within police program, the livestock system and environment. But they are doing two things about uh, the graduate fellowship. They are developing the individuals, making sure they have the right um, knowledge, right skills to do the research. But at the same time, they are focusing on institutions, saying that it's one thing to develop an individual but it's the other one to send them back and find that the institution that they go back to, there isn't a lot of enabling, supportive environment. So they're also focusing on the institutions to make sure that they have the right system, they have the right capacity to support and develop the fellows when they come back. So, so far we have five uh, fellows who have benefited from this program. We have ho for hosted four, we have sent one away, and the program is a four-year program, so in 2017-2018 we'll host some more. Um, very quickly, I also want to mention that not only are we developing or just getting the fellows here and saying, off you go, get mentorship from your, your supervisor, but we want to enrich their experience while they are at IRI. So one of the ways we are doing that is by providing some cross-learning or cross-cutting learning interventions. So 
We've been working with the research methods group and the PNOD to make sure that we provide some modular training. And the reason we are doing this is because, for one, when we talk of early career researchers at, at IRRI, it's not just the graduate fellows. We are looking at the research assistants, the research technicians, and all the others that support the research. So you could classify uh, them as early career researchers. So when we are looking at developing them, we have to, to be more broad and not just limited to the fellowship. So that's how come we work with the PNOD. But in terms of the RM, RMG group, they have the technical know-how, but the capacity development provides that uh, instructional design aspect to the way we do the modular training. So we've been able to provide those modules, and so far the reception has been really, really good. And I think the scientists are more benefiting from having fellows who can do better research by having this type of skills. Of course, we do a needs analysis, working with the fellows themselves to identify which needs, which key areas should we focus on, because there's quite a lot that we can do, as you can imagine. And I also want to mention the other way we are enriching the experience at IRI through the Journal Club. I like the Journal Club. We launched this Journal Club in January, and I have not missed any of the meetings because I really enjoy it. Fellows meet once a month, and they come together to discuss critically analyze journal papers. But then we also say, okay, Journal Club is supposed to be about journal papers, but it's an eerie journal club, so we can do, we can contextualize it for what we want to do. So they also exchange ideas, and they also come and critically evaluate each other's work. Like the PhD fellows who joined last year now are able to come and present their proposals, and they use that as a forum to really get a lot of feedback and to shape up the kind of proposals that they're developing. So this has been a really good initiative. Initially, we didn't have really good attendance, but towards the end of the year, I can assure you, when they come to my office, I tell them it's, it's a mandatory requirement <laughs> to attend a journal club. So it's really growing strong. Um, and then we have also launched an information system. Ido already mentioned this information system. I always tell of an experience very briefly. I'm aware we're going for lunch, but when I came, the first email I sent, it wasn't very popular, but I asked people to please send me a list of students that they have in their programs. And then everybody asked, then why do we have the CAP, the CAP Dev unit? At the time it used to be called CAST, like cast away, but it was capacity strengthening. <laughs> it didn't go very well, and it was not a good start. So you can imagine we didn't even know which students are around Erie at the time. But we've come a long way because since then now, if Shelley wants to me to pull out a report, I am able to do that, but from an Excel spreadsheet. So we say let's take it a step higher and come up with an information system. So this the system is capturing the whole of the business process from when programs want to request to hire a fellow, they just go to our online portal and they can make a request. And we get that and the approvals are done online. If you want to pull a report about your fellows, how many you've trained, what categories, you'll be able to just log in again and see your, your dashboard and check that out. So we're really becoming digital in a nice way, and I think this will make life easier for us as a unit, but also for the programs to be able to serve you better. We are hoping to, of course, integrate to LCS because it's a one common system, so we shouldn't have systems running in parallel. But for what we wanted the system to do, the first phase of OCS hasn't been able to do that, so we will run it parallel in the hope like next year or phase two of OCS will be able to integrate it. Um, and yeah, that's more about it. And um, I wanted to show this slide because like I mentioned about 2012, 2013, we had the APM and I led a very quick discussion around the graduate fellowships. And this is what people told me they wanted to see happen. <coughs> And I think uh, so far we've we've been able to tick some of those boxes, you know. I think, but um, there's still some room for for improvement in some of those aspects we need to work on. But of course, we have to start with baby steps. And um, so we think that in 2016 we are looking at reviewing and revising the current fellowship guidelines because there's still some. Um, areas that needs looking at in terms of how we align the administration with the people, other resources that are around Erie. So should we, of course, that this is currently being done in CAPDEV, 
but there are also people. So there are issues around people that need to be aligned for, for the institute as a whole. So that process is ongoing. We think that we need to look at quality. Remember my first slide, I talked about the quality of the, the individuals that we're producing. So we don't want to just say, I have done 206, but quality is so important. So we want to have a more robust monitoring and evaluation of the training, improve the supervision and mentoring practice, so we, we're working on that and seeing what kind of intervention we can come up with. Because you find that at IRI, we have really, really good mentors. But there's also the assumption about, because of what normally goes on, who is a good mentor or who should become a good mentor. Okay? So that's an area that we need to work up around. And then we need to mobilize resources as everybody is doing. But what I found really, really easy when I, we have mobilized uh, funds from DAD, from SACO, it's become so much easier to work or to go and tell a scientist, would you be willing to host this fellow? Would you be willing to supervise this fellow? When I have some money. But if I have to ask the other question of, would you be willing to fund and to host and supervise? The answer is likely to be yeah. I know. So we think that if we raise more money around fellowship or be more strategic about how the fellowships are funded around Erie, then we can also improve the quality around that. And of course, I think that within the biosciences, there is some underrepresentation of the people we are training. That's mostly because of the costs that are involved around. So you find that hosting a fellow within the biosciences would cost double the amount of money it costs to host somebody within the integrated sciences. And therefore, we find there's some underrepresentation around that. So going with the, uh, together with the resource mobilization is to make sure that, of course, we, we become more, more targeted to train people within biosciences. Gender, more women in science still needed. We are 39%. Not so bad, but again, room for improvement. Not unless you want to just say, cancel that list. This is what I think should happen. I want to open that over to you. Thank you very much.